it says starting recording and blanks the screen. More starting recording. And now it says in blue. All right, so here it goes. <laughs> so we had just been talking, by the way, about the half sutta and about friendship. When you understand that that's actually the teachings of the Buddha is it's all about friendship to become friends with your environment, to become friends with your own mind, to become friends with the objects that you allow into your mind. But we don't often we bring enemies in the mind just so that we can beat them up. Which means we're actually just beating up a part of our own mind. Because that's where the enemy is, is within the mind. So this is an important point also, that the whole teachings of the Buddha then can be seen in the sequence of since we are living in an environment that is unfriendly, both internal and external, that that unfriendly environment is, in fact, you could call the first noble truth is that you can define the first noble truth. There is dukkha, which would can been translated into we live in an, an unfriendly environment. And that unfriendly environment is both internal environment and the external environment. We grew up from babies in the external environment. And as that, we um, have picked up that external environment of being um, dangerous, manipulative, unfriendly. And so we become unfriendly with ourselves. An example of that, by the way, uh, we'll get into more of, is, is that we basically then go around giving ourselves unfriendly orders. And then we rebel against those unfriendly orders in an unfriendly way. Definitely. A really interesting way of saying it is like this, that the, that the student is there watching YouTube and he has the thought, you should be meditating. And then the thought comes, I don't want to, I want to watch the video. And now he starts running a guilt trip on himself. You ought to go meditate. How are you ever going to get any place if you don't meditate? And the answer to that is, leave me alone. You know, and so this is the kind of dialogue that we have with ourselves, all of it kind of unfriendly. But if we have uh, a, a slight change in attitude and the way that we use the mind, then when the thought you ought to be meditating comes up, then the natural response is going to be, thanks, that's a good idea. <sighs> ah, yeah, I feel so good. <laughs> friendly. That's a new, that's a, a more friendly way of dealing with ourselves. And it also has to do with doing it in the here now, because we thought of it in the here now rather than the way that Westerners think of meditation is some sort of planned activity, just like we plan all the other activities. And so we pay money and join a retreat. We have to rearrange our schedules and all kinds of things like that. And many of the retreat uh, people will say, you should go meditate once a day for an hour, maybe two hours a day. If you practice three hours a day, you'll get such enormous benefit. This is the field that the Wankers group says. And the answer to that is, is that no, we're going to be working on both sides of the fence. We're going to have both the internal and the external because we do not expect people in the Western world to do it the way that it's been done traditionally and still is done in Thailand, and that is after a few weeks of being a, a new monk and getting settled in, that monk is then sent to the forest. He's sent to a, um, actually a forest walk for training where he's going to be in seclusion to really get away from it all. 
You see, in fact, we don't want that young monk in the what where he was ordained because his mommy and daddy were there for the ordination and they're there for the Vendabot. When he goes out on Vendabot, he'll go home and we want that. We want mom and dad to see little Johnny as he's maturing. But then there comes a point when it's time to get away from it all. OK, and so he'll go out there and spend one, two, three months. In the Tibetan tradition, they've got it arranged that it's done kind of late in one's career, about after 10 years of being a monk, then you go into seclusion for three years. But the whole point about seclusion is very much a part of the Buddhist path, but in fact, <clears throat> in several of the suttas, but one in particular, number 36, because it's just so chakra block with strange information. He has the analogy of a log in a bog. And the log in the bog means that when a cypress tree falls over in the southern forest, it gets completely saturated with water so that it almost sinks to the bottom or sometimes does sink all the way to the bottom. And sometimes just the very top of the log is is floating. Um, and so that kind of log in the time of the Buddha, they had professional fire makers. Now it's really easy. I mean, we've got bioelectric and, and flint wheels and gas and lighter fluids and all kinds of things that they didn't have back then. Back then they had to make fire the old way. They had to rub. OK, so the Buddha's question then is, is that can you set that log in the bog on fire? Not yet. The answer is no, it's saturated with water. And then the question is, is, if you take that log and pull it out of the bog up onto the beach, can you then light it and set it on fire? Once it dries out. Aha, so the answer is no. Because the third question is then is, is that if you leave the log there for a few months, so that the gravity pulls the water out from the bottom and the sunshine uh, uh, roasts the top. At least enough of that log is going to be dry so that you can set it on fire. Now, from what I know about things that I've learned from time to time, that's exactly how a dugout canoe is made. Hmm. It is to get the dry the log dried out enough so that uh, you can burn out parts of it and that's most of the work is done by just burning it out but you want to make sure that it doesn't just burn a hole through here because uh. there's a whole lot of water in there okay so that means then that the log can actually be set on fire even though it's not completely dried out okay that's actually kind of a promise now you can also go and look at that analogy in the sense of seeing that the log in the bog means that the mind is in the world, completely full of the world. So much so that it's hard to tell the difference between what the person has in their own mind and what they heard on television that day. Yes. Um, and so um, we get away from it all. But when we go into seclusion, we bring the world with us, just like the log brings his own saturation water with him. Right. But when we get off into seclusion, that means that now the, the log has a chance to get dried out, just like when we're in seclusion, we're no longer watching television. We're not as, um, let us say, influenced by politics, mm -hmm. because you don't hear it. It's not there. It's on the, our world has no politics when we're in seclusion. Right. <clears throat> so that means then that the mind can get eventually dried out. And this is one of the ideas about a 10, 10 day meditation retreat. Uh, the way that it's talked about is the, thirst, the first three days, the students are just getting over getting into the retreat, including all the travel plans and all the stuff that's gotten there. And now they're ready for work but within three days of the end of the retreat. Now they spend those three days planning on getting out of the retreat. Right. 
And that that starts happening basically on day seven, they say, on the Goenka retreats. is because day seven is close enough to the end of it that people are saying, wow, this is about over. <laughs> but what happens in the middle of the retreat is often real misery. Because everything that was in the world that they used to occupy their time, now they don't have it. No books to read, no place to go, nothing to do. And their response to that is, yikes. <laughs> yikes. <laughs> and so um, the, the scheduling of retreat, real retreat, or uh, a, a more appropriate word would be seclusion, that I think that they picked up the word retreat because that's a very common word in, uh, in English. I mean, Christians have retreats. Um, so, um, talking about it in the sense of seclusion, that in fact, the, uh, the actual meditation retreats that are held now in the West don't even have the factor of seclusion built in them, that the Buddha recommends go to the forest, go to the foot of a tree, to an empty hut, uh, to a heap of straw and get away from it all. That's the thing. And yet when people think about meditation and hear about meditation, they see a meditation hall with cushions all lined up in a certain way with a path down between the middle. And then you have a dais or a um, altar or a, a place in front that either has got a, uh, a Buddha Rupa, a statue, incense, that kind of stuff, or maybe even a real monk or um, more than likely just a meditation teacher who is taking the place of, <clears throat> of the monk. So I don't see any seclusion there at all. Well, I guess you're at least secluded. But so they have to pretend to be in seclusion. They're pretending that they're alone. They close their eyes, and then to a degree, that's true. You could go so far as to say that, well, how, how fast, how quickly can I get secluded? The answer to that, as soon as I divert my eyes, I'm secluded from whatever I was looking at. So just merely closing our eyes is all you have to do is to go into seclusion. You didn't have to go to the retreat to do that. You could have closed your eyes while you were driving your car. <laughs> not recommended <laughs> not recommended exactly <laughs> and so we need to get into the right position but sitting on the couch at home or actually going to the woods and getting away from it all is actually already has diverted our eyes that the reason that we want to close the eyes in a meditation retreat is, is to actually create that delusion or illusion of seclusion. But the real seclusion is actually getting away from it all. And in many cases or in many respects, let's say, uh, that the meditation retreat actually does provide that. That most of the meditation retreat centers actually actively confiscate everything that's interesting the first day on um, of orientation right and so getting away from it all and getting secluded is the way to go also we understand you you probably heard the phrase guilt by association mm -hmm. yeah all right well there's also liberation by association ah okay OK, that if you're going to associate with nobles and they're acting nobly, that's an invitation for you to also begin to act nobly. Right. Which is one of the major benefits then of the retreat that re even though they call it retreats and seclusion and noble science and all of that kind of stuff, there's this additional factor that's going on that has to do with the association. That, that so that people can have an experience in the retreat that they wouldn't be able to have on their own because they've got no skill at it. And so retreats do have their advantage and that some of the disadvantages can be taken care of. Actually, sometimes by changing the rules. 
an example of that is, is that some of these uh, sessions, um, three or four of them a day, about half the time of the day, it's required for the students to be in the meditation hall. To where if they would relax that rule so that people can go and do anything they want to for this hour, so long as they're in noble silence, don't communicate with anybody and just go do what you're going to do so long as you're doing the practice. So this would be a way of, um, of loosening the rules so that things actually begin to get easier on the students, that these required sittings, the child's mind will rebel against. Mm. But in fact, that's part of the issue that's going on is, is that when you have a retreat that has a course manager and teachers and all of that, that the students will automatically put those people into a position of authority. Right. Well, than friends. Right. And so there's got some disadvantages to the way that retreats are run. Uh, that um, can be corrected by ch changing the, the style, the way that they're operated and things like that. Uh, but one thing to look at, and that is that these retreats actually didn't even exist until the 1950s for 2500 years. Buddhas have got along without retreats just fine, thank you very much. <laughs> because there's an old way of doing it, and that old way of doing it was one-on-one, -on -one, teacher and student, Kali and Metta with, uh, uh, with his friend, and sharing the Dhamma. That's how the Buddha taught Ananda, that's how Sariputta taught Ananda, that's how the Buddha taught Sariputta, was one-on-one. -on -one. And in that regard, that's actually now the friendship that's spreading. That um, a lot of the students have the idea that oh, the, these Dhamma teachers are up on a pedestal or on a dais or whatever like that. And the Western model is like a doctor or a priest or a, um, a, a psychologist. And the psychological model is, is that the, the therapist is always the therapist. And the client is always the client. Right. And the therapist gives one direction and the client gives the other direction. Mm -hmm. And it remains that way for the relationship of that, uh, for the entire relationship, that one up, one down position. Not only that, but the therapist becomes to rely upon the client, just like the client becomes reliant upon the therapist, supply and demand, you know. Mm -hmm. One gets bucks and the other one gets good feelings, but they can't give each other back and forth. The whole point of the Dhamma, and this is what I got from Achan Po, that my uh, initial response to him was like he became my mommy. Right. But over time, I just see him as my very best friend. <laughs> wow. Nice. Because it's up there equal now that we share at that level rather than uh, so uh, he shares the Dhamma, but now he's got me to sharing the Dhamma also. I, in fact, I'd be honest with you, I wouldn't be doing these uh, Skype calls if Achan Po said quit. If he said to stop, I'd stop because he, in fact, got it started in the first place. OK. All right. But the important point is the relationship uh, is not what they would refer to as uh, a guru sila or uh, a one up, one down thing, mm -hmm. but rather to become friends with each other. That's the whole point. But in but and so that's kind of then the guilt by association or the uh, uh, many, many examples of that. Uh, the guy who's most likely to become an alcoholic is the guy who hangs out in the bar, not yeah. the guy who hangs out in the forest. You are right. who you surround yourself with. Right. Guilt by association. That's the whole uh, way of it. But we can also uh, get away from all the unwholesome, get into seclusion, and to now if we've got the right skills and the tools, we can begin to develop friendship with ourselves on the inside so that we can become integrated or more whole 
we're not having arguments with ourselves anymore, that we've gotten to be unified. That's how friendly we are with ourselves, is that there's just one of us now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so with that kind of friendship, now we can take that back to the world as a, um, let us say, modus operandi. A method of operation is to operate with um, what they call the Brahma Viharas or the the homes of. Now, when we use the word Brahma Vihara, automatically the Western mind looks at the word Brahm or Brahma or Brahman and immediately thinks of God. And so the Brahma Viharas is referred to and translated as the home of the gods to where the other way of looking at it is, is that there is a caste system in India from the lowest Sudra up through the um, uh, the farmers and the merchant and then the uh, aristocracy and the military and then the priesthood or the Brahmins. So the Brahmins then this word Brahmin here is like uh, living in a high class way. The Brahma Vihara means your home is in high class. Not necessarily expensive, just top quality, high class. Would that, uh, the same as, would that be like the same as noble, high class and noble? Absolutely. That's in fact what, how we use that in English. Okay, another word that we could use would be honorable. Okay. Okay. When someone's acting in an honorable way, another way that we could use the word would be in the sense of uh, for the first 20 years, he's a child. For the next 50 years, he's a politician. And then, only then, can he become a statesman. (laughs) Okay. And basically, when we mean that statesman is, is that the politician is only interested in a few. He's interested in his own career. He's interested in the political party he belongs to. He's interested in having a a group of friends that bind together with strength so that they can be enemies with someone else. To where a true statesman is one who has transcended that political and has um, everyone's uh, best interest in mind. So in fact, This is why politicians go around calling themselves honorable is because they expect, you know, someday (laughs) that they might become honorable. (laughs) Good luck. (laughs) Good luck with that. (laughs) So even though someone does become an act honorable, honorably, he still is subject to criticism from those who are not honorable. I was, uh, in fact, with all that I'm seeing, I'm seeing that Joe Biden is trying to act honorably. He's doing the best job he can with the skills that he has, but boy, has he got a lot of competition for that. Not in the sense of many, many honorable people, but many people are trying to pull him out of his honorable position. And so, This is also true that he could, in fact, have a more honorable life if he would only get out of politics. Only then can he really become a statesman. And so this is what we mean by noble, high quality, Brahmin, uh, above it all, we could um, aristocratic to become above the crowd. And so these are the words that we have in in, uh, English because any of the other words that we would have would then be too highfalutin. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, enlightened. I mean, what does that word mean anyway? Because we have been uh, living for centuries in the West in a Christianized culture that has a lot of highfalutin magical ideas with it. When Buddhism comes up on the scene, instead of seeing it as something real that has real benefits, people immediately start seeing it as also highfalutin. I mean, way up there. 
top, yeah. I mean, uh, up in the sky, that's high. The sky daddies, mm -hmm. uh, dead men walking, uh, no sex babies, you know, the whole nine yards, really strange stuff. And so um, when Buddha comes along, we tend to do that with him, too. And there's a lot of stories that have been invented about the Buddha, but I think many of them are actually quite recent. Um, when I was a teenager, I read a book by Christmas Humphreys called The Light of Asia. It was written in the 1940s or something like that. He was one of the co uh, original founders of the Polytech Society. And that book is 100% magical. All of the stuff that I know about the Buddha that has to do with magical beliefs about the Buddha, I got from that book, and I have not seen any other magical stuff about Buddhism that Christmas Humphreys wasn't able to find a way of putting into his little small book about the Buddha. And that seems to be the way this light of Asia is the way that Buddhism got uh, widespread as if it were something magical. We still have a lot of people that are looking for magic. To where the real magic is friendship. <laughs> That's nice. That's the real magic is to learn to become friends with your own mind. That's what the teachings of the Buddha is really all about. So dukkha means that we are actually living in for our own mental state, an uncomfortable environment. It's not satisfying. Right. And, the, and there's a reason that we do that to ourselves. And that is, is that in our society from childhood, we are taught by society to want things. Yeah. That we get jealous. We see Billy has that, so Bobby wants it too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, we learn jealousy. And one of the ways that we learn jealousy actually is... Um, uh, quite interesting that when a child is born, mom nurtures. She, I mean, those two, the, the brand new baby and mom are absolutely best friends. Um, they call it bonding. There's actually a bonding chemical that happens in the brain. And that uh, one of the stories that can be told is, is that most maternity wards gather together almost everybody who can get, get go there wants to be in the room when mom gets that new baby when after she's delivered and she's not so dopey and the baby's been cleaned up and then the nurse will bring that infant in and everybody gets really gushy and goosebumps and cries with joy and all of that why is that because of that bonding right but it doesn't last long at all. In fact, it only lasts maybe three or four years at best. And one of the places where it gets destroyed is when mom has a new baby that she bonds with. And now little Tommy has to be mommy's little helper. He is no longer the star of the friendship show. He gets shoved aside. And he resents it. Mm. He gets jealous of the baby. And so mom works really hard to try to bring them together and all of that, but it doesn't work sometimes. Sometimes brothers are the best of friends and sometimes they're the worst of enemies. Depends upon the age and, and whatnot. But it's also possible for that second child to be born after little Tommy goes through his own hell without a baby to create it. In the sense that he can be uh, given rules. In other words, society comes in to interfere with mom and her nurturing of her infant and her baby. And what the society says, that kid's got to grow up. Mm -hmm. you got to send that kid to school. You've got to put him in certain kind of clothes. You got to teach him ABCs and one, two, threes, put down your cell phone, do your homework, clean your room, and here it goes, okay? And we have lost that nurturing, and now mom becomes bossy, bossy, bossy. And daddy, I'm not, you know, picking on mom, but she was the one who did all the really good, gooshy nurturing in the beginning. That's part of the reason why we have such a close bond with our moms. 
because without mom, we don't live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's that whole gushiness then we begin to get weaned from, and we don't like it very well. And so what the real teachings of the Buddha is all about is let's go back to that feeling that we had where everything was all right, everything was taken care of, everything was cushy and warm and friendly and kind, because we can have that kind of mentality. There's no reason for little Tommy to, um, let us say, live the way that he has chosen to live, but he did so because he was given a bunch of marching rules and orders, and you go do this and you go do that. And so we store all of that stuff inside the mind. All the all the things, and here's something that's also quite interesting about the human mind and the human being is, is that many times a, a little time he will spend a lot of his time in joy. But after school, he goes and he plays. But when he grows up, he doesn't remember all of those hours and play and joy that he spent. He remembers how much he hated school. (laughs) We remember the tragedies. We remember the dangers. We remember the things that we don't like and we forget all about the good times. It's time to bring that mentality back so that we start paying attention to how nice things really are. We can learn to play again. We become a kid again, doing what we did again. This is noble. Rather than being involved with the cares and the worries and the frustrations and the battles of Western civilization. It is based upon capitalism, and you know how people are touting how wonderful capitalism is, right? Well, capitalism is nothing but taking advantage. I want money, and I'll do whatever I need to do to get it from you, and I don't care about what happens to you so long as I get money. Capitalism is very, very selfishly oriented. Sure almost to the point that it's hard to make friends in a capitalistic society. That's why people don't have very many friends, is because the system, systemic problems. People probably tend to have a little bit of a natural mistrust built in when you, even if you're trying to make friends, maybe uh, it's hard to feel open. Mm Mm-hmm, exactly. And so that means that we want to actually cultivate friendships with people who are willing to be open, to have noble friends. This is what the word Sangha means, is to have noble friends. We feel so lucky that we have uh, at home a little Sangha of two at the very least. Yes, absolutely. And that can grow. That's, That's part of the reason for the Skype. That, that it's the, uh, um, the change in the way that we think in our mind. It's the teachings that give that. And it's also the friendships that we can make uh, with dealing with other people who are like-minded. That's the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. That's the triple gem. And that, and that triple gem is uh, got some pieces missing when it came to the West. Not a whole lot of Buddhists came this time. All we got was a bunch of books that were poorly translated. And there's not much Sangha around. In fact, now the Buddhists compete with each other over who can be the best Buddhist. (laughs) (laughs) Instead of recognizing that, no, this is, um, that's a major point about the Sangha, uh, about uh, the monkhood that I learned in Thailand that was so strange for me But I learned it very early, and I learned it in a big, big way because the the Wat made sure that I learned this. This was one of the lessons I think that Achan Po instigated, but was not a part of. Because you see, I had there was another Westerner at the at the Wat. His name was Santicaro. He's quite famous. He's got I mean, he was a monk for 18 years and has a retreat center in um, Wisconsin, I think. Uh, 
and he was the main translator from Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. But when he came to watch So and Mo, he came uh, because they were closing down the um, refugee centers from the Vietnam War. Finally, the United States was forced by the World Health Organization, Thailand, and uh, many other countries to start taking the refugees in the 1970s. That was the group that I actually lived with in the United States. There's more than 400 watts, maybe 350 at least, in the United States. And yet Westerners, they don't know because yeah. they read Western books on Buddhism. And uh, many times, even if the uh, Wat has a website, it's in Thai language or Laotian or uh, Khmer. And so there's still a great big cultural gap. But inside of those watch there in the United States, there you will find Sangha. There you will find monks who live together, cooperate with each other uh, for the benefit and the uh, welfare of the many. Uh, but outside of there, Buddhism is all about meditation and um, uh, co uh, cooperation that winds up being um, competition. Mm. And so finding a way of being friends um, is something that is hard for the Westerners to do because it's not built into our capitalistic culture. Therefore, getting away from that all and coming to yourself. So now we're looking at, well, how do we actually then practice the teaching of the Buddha so that we can get our own mind integrated and stop arguing with ourselves on the inside? The answer to that is the third noble truth, in fact, is what we've been talking about is this friendship and cooperation and everything is OK and there's no problems and there's all nurturing and everything like that. And yet a lot of people don't even talk about the third noble truth because they don't even know what it means. It actually just means being free from suffering. So if you're satisfied, that means that you're not dissatisfied. Right. That's what it means. It means to be satisfied, a very ordinary thing. People go throughout the day being satisfied, dissatisfied, and they do so ignorantly. They don't even know that they're satisfied or dissatisfied because they're not paying attention. That that's actually what the real issue of the second noble truth is. The reason that people are dissatisfied is because they're not paying attention to what is it that's satisfying and what is it that's not satisfying. And so we continue to do things that are not satisfied and we remain dissatisfied with it. Ignorantly. <laughs> so this is all about waking up and paying attention and look at what's going on. That's the whole teaching of the Buddha right there is to look, to pay attention, to wake up, to see. Now, the waking up is actually a sati. But okay. paying attention and looking, that's one's right noble view. Okay. Unfortunately, the word view has many different uses. And that the way that Westerners use the word view is differently than the way that it's used in the suttas normally. A right noble view is different than ordinary view. In fact, that ordinary view is a viewpoint or a concept or a mental way of looking at it. You can think of it in the sense of a worldview. Right. Right. It's based upon knowledge and it's based upon investigation and it's kind of long term because a lot of that knowledge came from any place, wholesome or unwholesome or whatnot. You know, that in fact, a lot of the information that we carry is false. Especially when we've got people intentionally lying to us. We talked Why? on our last call, we talked, we touched, you touched a little bit about on um, the ordinary right view versus the noble, noble right view, the one fixed viewpoint versus being able to see it from many viewpoints and you mentioned that maybe viewing would be a better way Precisely. of. Precisely. Exactly. Or looking. Okay. Or 
even going to Sherlock Holmes investigation that in fact ordinary right view and investigation is like the distinction between Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. to where they both walk into the room and uh, Dr. Watson surmises and guesses and thinks about it and all that kind of stuff. And what does Sherlock Holmes do? He gets out his microphone or his microscope or his uh, uh, looking glass and he starts investigating and he looks at every little thing. And that's why he is ca capable of coming up with the stuff that he does come up with is because all of that evidence is laying there in, in plain sight. But Dr. Watson's not paying attention to what's going on. He thinks he already knows. So thinking that we already know how things ought to be and should be, then that's ordinary folks. And you can also see that that's the uh, the authority, the one who says this is how things should be. That in fact, that's the distinction between right view and wrong view is that the wrong view has the statement of whatever it is in this moment, I can get away with it. I can right. do what I want to do and get away with it. I can be scot free. Very selfish position. The position held by drive by shooters and all bank robbers and um, college kids, all of us, you know, getting drunk. I'll get away with it. I'll be in class tomorrow. I'll be OK. You know, that's the idea. And the ordinary right view has the position of no, you can't yeah. get away with it. We have a God. We have a law of comma. We have cops. We have a military. We're, we, we are the teachers. We are the ones, the authoritarians, and we're going to make sure that you do it right because we know what is right and what is wrong. We've got a book who tells us so. So the view is being imposed upon you by authority rather than. Exactly. This okay. actually then, that part of the mind is what the Buddha then uh, would refer to then as ordinary right view is sila bhatta paramasa. Sila bhatta paramasa means attachments to rights, rules, rituals, and the way things that should be. All of the shoulds, woulds, could haves, regrets, and all of that comes out of the fact that we've got some sort of internal standard that we set up when we were children, mostly from our parents, about how things should be. And we go around comparing every moment with how it should be. This is what we mean by critical thinking, that we go around critically guessing what is good and what is bad, what is I like and what is I don't like. And that's the second noble truth right there. I like it. I don't like it. That's the judgment. Rather than the nurturing is, is that everything's OK? Everything's all right. We don't have to judge one being better than the other. We've been trying to kind of play a game with that throughout the day in, in you know, just shouting out every time that it happens to us, that we, that we notice it within ourselves, that, uh, you know, a like or dislike or um, uh, a judgment or a preference or a comparison. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets tiring because it's pretty constant. <laughs> Like. That that's good knowledge. That's the wake up. The wake up basically is to see it and 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 see it over and over and over again. But also when we see it, but we see it in the way that we still have that um, ordinary right view or that judgment in there. When we see it, we don't like it because it's not up to our standard. Right. Mm -hmm which means that we stay stuck in that hindrance. Here's an example of it that happens in meditation. Goenka says, watch the breath, note the breath, and if the mind wanders away from the breath, never mind, start again. And students don't do that. They start watching the breath, they note the breath, the mind wanders away from the breath, and then they wake up and they recognize that the mind has wandered away from the breath. And what do they start doing? 
Oh yeah. no, monkey mind. Oh, this is terrible. Oh me, I'll never learn how to do this meditation. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I didn't hear the directions correctly. Maybe the teacher is full of, you know what? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> right, so here comes the doubt, yeah. which is a hindrance. Here comes the unhappiness and the disappointment and the misery to where the real teachings of the Buddha is to gladden the mind whenever we see this, to take the opportunity to make a change. Okay, so when we are... When the mind wanders away, never mind, start again. We go through this routine of the the hindrances and whatnot. That's basically a conversation between the parent ego state and the child inside. Mm. Aha, you screwed up. <laughs> you're a little turd. You're no good at all. Okay. And we have that kind of dialogue. You can hear the separation. We're a crowd inside, and it's an unfriendly crowd. Yeah. So we can start practicing uh, friendship immediately, or we can practice it in the words of nurturing immediately, in the sense of never mind, never mind that you caught yourself doing that. Just start again, come back. Or another way of of saying it is, uh, the Buddha had the phrase, "Aha! I see you, Myra. Aha! I caught you." Right. right, a, a joyful uh, gladdening the mind, brightening the mind, because this thought, aha, I see you, Myra, is the next thought, which means that the old thought of the hindrance has just been chased out. You've already successful when you can say, aha, I see you. You know, so we that this is something you know we've been trying to do and trying to um, make that be a friendly, joyous occasion. Um, but I still get stuck often instead of it being, ah, hi, I see you, Mara. It's instead it turns into, hi, Mara, you're here again. <laughs> and and, and uh-huh, then guess what? That's what you need now to start seeing because you can you can see it in general. See it when it happens immediately. When you see that inside yourself, you can say, aha, uh-huh, even though I know that I can say uh, with joy, I see you, Mara. There's no joy in this mudville. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, then it just layers, you know, I just I do it and and sometimes and you can think of it that way, but you can also think of it more in the sense of just one mind moment after another mind moment after another mind moment after another mind moment. When you get layers, somehow we get the illusion of gravity and so things get heavy as they get piled up with weight. Okay. And so friend. thinking of it longitudinally rather than vertically is a much better um, way of looking at it. I like that. So you just see it over and over and over, over again. And over and again. Right. So it's not building up. It's not piling up. The past is dead now. It's gone. Now is a new moment. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, let's gladden this moment. Never in mind that I missed the last moment. If I start remorsing over the past, I'm just right back into... Uh, ordinary right view rather than the investigative right view. And so we're talking about it now in the sense of the right view, but we can only do this when we remember to do it. So sati is the is the most um, important skill to be developed. If you develop sati, intentionally develop sati, right view will come along with some effort. But the actual skill to be developed initially is right view. This is why we want to do this um, uh, sati once on the in-breath and once on the out-breath. That helps build it up because we keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. That's why we make it intentionally a long breath because that takes that effort to make it a long breath, which is part of the sati. They get very close together. But in fact, The third item on the list is right effort. And the right effort is to breathe wholesomely. And also the right effort is to throw out the unwholesome parts of the mind and replace it with wholesome thoughts. And the more wholesome thoughts they are, then the more gladdening the mind is. And so you can see that negative thoughts are obviously unwholesome, but gladdening thoughts, brightening the thoughts, thoughts of being a winner, thoughts of success, 
thoughts of fearlessness, thoughts of comfort, thoughts of satisfaction, thoughts of success. These are the kind of thoughts that we want to have, because if we have the thoughts of safety and security, we'll begin to feel safe and secure. If we have thoughts of being comfortable, then we will begin to feel comfortable. If we have thoughts of uh, satisfaction, we become satisfied. And there we go. Now we're free from dukkha. We're free from dissatisfaction because we just talked ourselves into being satisfied. This is what we mean by the first three items on the Eightfold Noble Path run and circle around each other. They build up on one another. And that by practicing sati and by practicing right effort, the right view really comes along with that so that we're watching, we're watching, but we're watching only when we remember to watch. And the Buddha makes these things separated. In English, we've kind of combined them together and called it mindfulness. And because we've divided it up, or we've separated, excuse me, because we've taken two separate distinct things and combined them together, it winds up being a bit confusing that people really don't know what we mean by mindfulness. We thought we think about it as paying attention and all that kind of stuff, which is part of it, but it's got to have that wake up. We've got to be here now. We've got to remember. Literally, it is waking up and smelling the coffee. To smell, that's the in-breath. Also, the smell of the coffee is uh, an olfactory sense, which means we're smelling it in the present moment. So waking up and smelling the coffee is meditation. That's okay. it. But we want to wake up the other senses, too, especially the body sensations. Because when we were little kids, everything hurts. Everything hurts. When we fall down, it hurts. When we bump our elbow, it hurts. Kids cry a lot because things hurt a lot. What we do with that, we stop paying attention to what's happening with the body. We try to ignore it. And so we don't pay much attention to the body. But when we start breathing again, now we're paying attention to the body because we're looking at the fact that now the body is feeling pleasant. It's feeling comfortable. So when we're going about our daily life, um, there's so much to pay attention to, right? So what, what would you suggest um, trying to anchor in on? Is there a, a specific the sense? Breath. The, the breath. breath is your first anchor. Okay. Okay. OK, or you could say that the breath is like the port. For the ship, that's where cargo comes in and out. Right. So that's your home port or that's your place. So that's the resting point should be mindfulness of breathing. Sati, knowing that this is a long, deep in breath and a long, deep out breath. And then after that, we can add some of the features of uh, Anapanasati on top of that. But if we're breathing in long, deep breath, that means that we're breathing not at 20 breaths a minute, we're down to six or to five breaths a minute, which is about 10 or 12 seconds. Well, in 10 seconds, that's 100 mind moments. There's 100 things that are happening, and when we're asking for two of them, sati on the in breath and sati on the out breath, to remember that this is going, and if you remember to take a long, deep breath, it will be. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of watch it going being a long breath, but you've already decided that it was a long breath. And so it didn't take much sati to do it. That means you have a lot of other mind moments now, but the beginner needs to just pay attention to the long, deep in breath and the long, deep out breath. But once we got that, now we can also start paying attention to the thoughts that we have, whether they're wholesome or not. Mm -hmm. So and if they go ahead. I was just going to ask, when you're paying attention to the breath, um, is this paying attention to it as a concept or as a sensation? Yes, as a sensation. Okay. Absolutely as a sensation rather than as a concept. Um, in the sense that you even know that an in-breath is an in-breath, a long in-breath, not because you're looking at a mirror or having a video that you're watching so that you can see it, no, you can actually experience in the sense of sensation, you can feel it. You feel the rise of the chest. You feel the extension of the abdomen. You can feel the touch in the back. Then, in fact, you can feel the touch of the cloth, the shirt, 
that has little borders here. You can feel that. When you're breathing in and breathing out, you can feel where the the uh, the cloth is touching. So the touch of the cloth, the touch of the air, uh, the movement of the cloth on the skin, uh, and so that we begin to notice the chest moving, the belly extending a bit. But the belly, by the way, and we've talked about that belly breathing uh, uh, in Western civilization for a lot. In fact, uh, the first thing I ever heard was contemplation of the navel. Navel gazing, they called it. Hmm. I don't know where they came from, other than maybe a mistranslation, because nobody breathes with their belly. That's hmm. not where breathing happens happens in the lungs and so what is the movement of the lungs is what we're wanting to pay attention to you want to feel the rib cage expanding you want to feel the stretch of the skin you want to feel the diaphragm descending in fact a good idea is to try to identify where the diaphragm is because you can feel it and what i mean by the diaphragm i'm talking about in fact it's a set of muscles right. and those muscles surround the bottom part of the rib cage that help it open and extend downward so that the uh, uh, the, the air sac or the, the lungs can move in and out. Uh, when you breathe in, you breathe in because of a vacuum. Right. Because the body actually expands this area and now the small lungs that are expanding and so the air wants to come in. Right. And when we breathe out, it's because the air is pushed out because of the contraction of the muscles. And all the stuff, uh, the rib cage, everything is in motion. And yet we're not paying much attention to that, any of it. And yet it's all very much alive. And so starting to pay attention to the body and noticing the body, because part of what we're going to be noticing also is to let it relax. Mm -hmm. Relaxation is the intention of this, and, and in the suttas, they've got highfalutin language, something like tranquilizing the body. When I hear the word tranquilizing, I see people with big dart guns shooting elephants and whatnot, and the elephant falls over completely out of it. If anything, that's the exact opposite of being relaxed, being shot. <laughs> <laughs> Unconscious. <laughs> Not very relaxing. Sounds Unconscious out of it, exactly. Instead of being pleasantly relaxed. So that's what we're looking for, is a body that's just relaxed and comfortable. We're looking for comfort. So that's a, kind of strange, because in the meditation retreats, and some of them, even with Goenka, they have a strong determination sitting. You're supposed to sit there for an hour. With your eyes closed and your hands closed and your feet closed or your legs closed and you're not supposed to move and everybody gets really uncomfortable doing that. And that's not the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha is teaching to become comfortable, relaxed, easy. So at Watso and Mok at the retreats there, they have a maximum sitting time of 30 minutes. And even then they tell the students that if you're not comfortable to stand up. That if you sit back down and you're still uncomfortable, stand up and walk outside. Go walk meditation. You don't have to do any particular thing. The intention is, is to feel safe, secure, comfortable, and then we can feel satisfied. And when we feel satisfied over and over again, we begin to feel uh, successful. Successful, satisfied, content, and safe are jhana factors, the pitti and the sukha. The sukha, in fact, is the dukkha and sukha are exact opposites. In the, even in the Thai language, dukkha and sukha are opposites, but also in another language in India, the Gujarati language, dukkhi and sukhi are opposites. Perfect. And so if you are in a state of satisfaction, that means that you're not in a state of dissatisfaction. And so getting yourself into a state of satisfaction is what the practice is all about. Getting yourself satisfied and content, which means that you stop arguing with yourself, you stop being full of doubt, and you start just being safe and secure. Everything's okay right now. This is actually the practice. And so practicing that 
over and over again. And we've actually not now talked about the Eightfold Noble Path, but we've touched on many aspects of Anapanasati. Because, in fact, we're going to now add a fourth ingredient into the Eightfold Noble Path, and that is in the Pali Sama Sankapa, which is sometimes translated as right thought or right intention. But a deeper level of it is has to do with right attitude. There's very, very um, strong indications in other places in the suttas that it, this is a, an attitudinal change, not just a thought change. Because your attitude determines your thoughts. So of a winner. Yeah, so you begin to have the attitude of a winner, which is the can-do attitude, and now the thoughts are going to be how to accomplish it and getting it done. If you have a victim's attitude, you're out now having thoughts about who you can get to help you. Yeah. Because you can't do it on your own. Can I say, well, can I share one thing about that? Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to the the half sutta and making friends with yourself as as a big portion of it. Um, recently, the whole thing. <laughs> recently, you know, um, my we we had an argument, and I was feeling pretty down and really um feeling disconnected from him, and um was just feeling terrible. And then uh, I, I went ahead and I sat and I was, you know, intending to nurture myself and I was finding it really difficult. And because you kept thinking about the argument. Exactly. I kept thinking about the argument and I kind of had this realization that um, even though I felt upset with him and disconnected from him at the same time, there was a conflict because I also wanted him to comfort me. And I kind of had this realization that 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 was just another layer of dukkha for myself in that moment was desiring for him to comfort me. And then that not happening because we were in an right, argument. Because you're a victim of him, you know. I mean, he got you upset, so it's up to him to get you to feel happy again. Exactly. And then I so I saw that line of thinking and I, you know, I tried to toss it out. And I eventually did through breathing and through gladdening the mind. I got myself into a wonderful state and I, I came out of my sit feeling fantastic. And I had this uh, this phrase that came to mind. You know, I, I thought it was was um, I thought it was him that that was, you know, the most important thing in my life. But it really came down to I was what I've been missing my whole life, that that. Mm -hmm portion of me that nurture from myself and it was like the first time I got myself to feel so wonderful and I just felt so good afterwards and I I couldn't believe that it was there all along just inside of me. <laughs> <laughs> well the first thing that I have to say is congratulations Thank you. <laughs> you now can see for sure that the Dhamma works yeah. Even though when you were doing it, that you had to keep throwing that thought of he's bad out. You could. Yeah. You did it. Congratulations. Yeah. That's oh. excellent. Wow. Now you know that you can do it. This is what we're meaning by Sama Sankapa. That's what sparked right then. It was that idea that it's not up to him. It's up to me and I can do it. I can feel good. Yeah. I can make friends with myself. And in fact, I'll even have a better friend with him if I can be friends with myself. And if he'll make a better friend with himself, then the two of us could really get it on then. Exactly. Yeah, yeah we're really starting to see that in real life. You know, from, from an ordinary view, we, we have a, a wonderful relationship and always have, but we're, we're seeing the ways in which we can have an even better relationship through being there for ourselves. First and foremost, yes, right. Having that uh, wonderful relationship with yourself makes your makes it possible to have a wonderful relationship with someone else or your entire environment. Yeah, I feel so I just feel so grateful for for that ability and for that to, to just be something that can happen. <laughs> so you're actually beginning to practice it. I think that that's so great. Congratulations again. Yeah.
<laughs> I feel really gushy inside just knowing that this Dharma works, that I'm actually able to convey it so that it becomes of value to others. I really like that when I get success stories from the students. And here you are so, I mean, we've only had a chat or two, and here you are finding out that it's working right away. Mm. So now that you know that, that's the change of attitude from um, I'll give it a try, but I don't think it'll work and all of that kind of thought process into hot dog. We, we know this is working now. This is a good. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a very, very important step. And the next step is even more profound. And that is, in fact, the, the next step that I'm talking about is actually the very first step of the noble path. And that is, is that when you come to that uh, Sama Sankapa position of right attitude so that you know without a doubt that no matter how obstructed the mind gets, no matter how deep into an argument or how bad things get, you can, in fact, come out of it and come back to a state of seeing the things the way they really are, see the truth, be in the present moment, and deal with things well. That is the first knowledge. The Buddha talks about that in a particular sutra number 48. The first knowledge that is noble, that is supramundane, which means above the world, that is a factor of the Eightfold Noble Path. This is the Sankapa coming in. And it is not a view or knowledge held by ordinary people. Ordinary people are victims. Ordinary people don't know that, hey, uh, each one of them doesn't know that, hey, I can pop out of my craft immediately. All I have to do is remember to pop out of it. <laughs> That's, in fact, why sati is so important. It doesn't matter what skills we have if we forget to practice them when we need them most. Yeah. Okay, so now that you've been able to practice correctly, even when you needed it really badly, there'll be other times when you'll need sati really badly throughout your life. Sometimes you really need it. For me, it's walking into the uh, immigration. I really need some sati when I go to immigration. <laughs> and so um, this is that development, and that's that noble knowledge that no matter what happens, I can get out of it and deal with the situation beautifully. One example that I have is that is here we are tooling down the highway and we see red and blue flashing lights behind us accompanied by the sound of a siren. And when I say that right now, how do you feel? Yeah, Who right. I, I've been there. I've been there, right? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. it gets us, doesn't it? Just the thought of getting stopped. Yep. And we haven't even gotten arrested yet. Well, guess how many people feel very afraid when they get stuck? They've heard so many stories about how bad cops are, especially if you've got a certain kind of skin. And so people are very afraid when, they cop, when the cop stops them. When the cop stops them and they see the person agitated and fearful, and the cop may not even know this consciously, it's picked up subconsciously, but he becomes afraid too. And now he's got his hand on his gun. And he's and and so now the person gets even more frightened and more afraid and together they make a tragedy based on irrational fear. But if you can get stopped by the cop, then the way to handle it is uh, mindfully and giving the cop what he wants immediately. And so I roll down the window and the cop comes up and he says, hi, officer, I'm really glad to see you guys out tonight. You know, the whole community is much safer because you guys are on duty. I just want to thank you so much for doing such a wonderful job. What can I do for you, officer? If you start that conversation that way, you might not even get a ticket. <laughs> so see him as a friend, just like See him as a friend. Hi, officer. I'm really glad to see you guys out on duty tonight. Friendly. Exactly. But that takes that sati to remember 
to wake up and to be here now, to remember that you're going to get more out of that cop by being friendly with him than you are about being afraid of him. Or worse still, because of your afraidness or fear, you act angrily to him. What the heck are you guys doing out here? This is nothing but a sting operation. There ought to be, in fact, there are laws. This is unconstitutional. I ought to have you arrested. You know, if you have that attitude towards a cop, it's not going to go well. (laughs) There's videos of it of YouTube of people trying that kind of stuff, and it never goes well. We've been uh, we've been trying to employ that uh, friend friend seeing people as a friend attitude when you know we have to call the electric company or something like that and you're speaking to somebody on the other line who may not even have the authority to to you know do one thing or another for you but if if you speak to them as a friend often you get a friend speaking back to you which hmm. ends up being exactly because. Here. Think about it that way, that if you're on the other end of the phone and you're and you listen to this woman complaining about her electricity. And now after uh, late in the afternoon, you've heard 30 women complaining about their electricity. And then someone calls and they're all friendly about it. Makes your day. Yeah. Yeah. So you can go around making people stay because they'd have to deal with so much of the other stuff already anyway. Why give them any more of it? Because that doesn't work. <laughs> We're doing it mindly, mindlessly. Uh, the way that is, you've probably heard this expression before, it's even attributed to Einstein. And that is, is that doing the same things over and over again and expecting a new result is the definition of insanity. And yet that's what we do when we operate instinctually. We're just doing the same things over and over again, and they don't work. This is why um, we want to wake up and look at what's going on to see it. I actually talked about this with one of the first conversations I had with Vicky Buddha Dasa uh, concerning meditation and uh, right effort. And I said, Uh, The expression that if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And who said, no, no, Bikabuda does, in fact, he chuckled. And he says, if at first you don't succeed, look at what you're doing. (laughs) Smart. (laughs) Okay, not just sati, which is try, try again. You know, you failed and try again. No, now you need to really look at what you're doing. You're making yourself miserable. That's what you're doing. Mm. We, I, and so I say it like this to the students, that you have talked yourself into feeling bad for your whole life. Now it's time to remember to talk yourself into feeling good. And does that just take time over and over again to become habitual? Yes. Except that I wouldn't say that it takes time. It just takes another time and another time and another time, another moment, another now. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. One at a time. Aha. Uh-huh, I caught you again. Aha. Uh-huh, I see that again. Well, I'm glad I can see that. Then it becomes, well, I'm glad I don't have to think about that. Mm-hmm. I don't have to think about that argument. I don't have to think about writing that email. I don't have to think about going to the bank. I don't have to think about all of that stuff that if I thought about it, it would be a uh, planning work to do. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to do that. I don't have to plan any work. Then, in fact, we call it work. We call it a job when employment could be called a toy. If we have the right friendly attitude towards it. Again, have you ever heard of Alfred E. Newman? No. I don't think so. Mad Magazine, back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Alfred E. Newman, and his motto was, what, me worry? Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah. All right. That's the attitude. That's the winner's attitude of what? Me worry? I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> I, like I can it. take care of that. It's not work anymore. It's now just a toy to play with. My whole life is now just full of toys. <laughs> I, got the biggest, I got the biggest toy box. 
We all do, I guess, huh? We all. Yeah, have everybody's got the biggest toy box. The whole place is none but a toy box, if you have the right attitude. Right. But if there's something in that toy box that we're avoiding, then that means that it's work. It's we don't like it. It's uh, uh, associated with bad feelings, it's, which means that let's go take a look at that. Maybe it's not so bad after all. Maybe I can turn it into a toy. We can turn it into a toy. Absolutely. Any alarm clock can become a toy. <laughs> I remember because I did that exactly. How was that? It, well, we would, first off, a, a friend, because I was too little to do it myself at the time, but he nailed that alarm clock to a board to make it look like a, uh, a Tommy, uh, Tommy gun. <laughs> And so all I had to do is to wind it up like that. And then <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. Right. So that's that's what we can do. We can turn anything into a toy. Yes, it's just more difficult when it's waking you up in the morning. Actually, that's the very, very best time to practice. I should mention that, that when you first wake up in the morning. What happens? What's the very first thing within the first second? Well, my cat meowing at me. <laughs> well, no. Uh, it's that you know that the cat, that knowledge comes, that you uh, wake up literally. What's the first thing that happens when you wake up in the morning? You wake up. That's the first thing that happens. <laughs> it's a trick question, you know. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, okay. And that's the waking up point. That means that now the thing to do is that you recognize that um, that you're in the bed. You re recognize that because of your body, your body's posture. You know what body posture you have. Are you on your back or are you on your side? Is your face in the pillow? Is the face towards the ceiling? All of that kind of stuff happens within the sec per second or so. That we wake up and we become here now and then everything starts up. Right. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is a really excellent time to practice. So that when things start up, we start up with, wow, isn't this nice? What a wonderful day this is. Everything's going to my way. Oh, what a beautiful morning. I mean, I've heard that song. <laughs> and so we begin to just have a few happy thoughts. We can do it in the form of songs that we've heard. Zippity doo da. Wow, what a wonderful day. What a wonderful world, Satchmo would say. <laughs> and so we spend about five or ten minutes taking deep breaths, thinking that the day is going to be such a nice day. Everything's going to be okay. Everything is fine. I can handle this day easily. Everything becomes easy peasy. What a toy this day is going to be. These are the kind of thoughts to get ready for the day, as opposed to affirmations about how wonderful you are, because you don't even believe that. Right. <laughs> that right. We're not, yeah. So this is not affirmations. This is actually repeating to ourselves things that are actually true. Yeah. And so we can believe it. We can actually believe, you know, I really do feel good right now. This morning it's great. I don't have to get out of bed right now. I can lay here for a minute or two or five or ten if I want to. And just enjoy. And so that's the morning meditation. Before you even get out of bed, get yourself into a really, really good state. What a lovely base that must give you for the rest of the day. Go give it a try. Find out for yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't put it in your parent ego state. Oh, I must do this. Right. Brother, do it because you like it. Yeah. OK, so this has been a very interesting um, introduction to Anathanasati. We'll go into some of the details later, but we've actually been covering quite a lot of it. Relaxing the body is step four. Gladdening the mind is step 10. Investigating the mind is step five. Um, um, Sukha is step uh, six, Pitti, step five. They're not in any particular chronological order. 
but you will find things one by one as they occur. You will find what order things are in. So uh, the, our first call, you mentioned um, a book or a talk given by uh, Buddha Dasa um, Anapanasati for serious beginners. And mm -hmm. just found that online. So would that be a good resource to tap into, I, I assume, or? Uh, yes, and that if there are questions that you have about the book, uh, especially if there's apparent differences between what I'm teaching and what you find in the book, then sure, question me about it. Okay. I was right there when that was recorded. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, I think the name that you mentioned, um, the other... Santa Caro? Yeah. Santa Caro, he's the uh, translator of that book. It sounded familiar in there. Okay, so that would be a good a good spot to... to to check out while we're um, calling with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. That reminds me, I didn't even finish that story. Oh yeah. Yeah, the story was is that I um, inadvertently uh, criticized Santi Caro because he came from um, the refugee camps and he was really excellent with Thai language. And I was hot off the uh, uh, the floor from India, and had ten years of meditation experience under my belt. We were in different worlds, and in fact, in our world at, at Wat So and Mok, uh, it was different because he was used as a translator, but I was used as an actual teacher. And so I actually one time said to someone, I don't remember any of that. Because uh, it wasn't important at the time that I just mentioned, well, Santa Caro is not a meditator, he's a translator. No. The next day, I was visited by a whole delegation of monks, some of which I knew and some of which I didn't, but none, but they were Achan Po and, and others uh, more uh, close to me were not there. And they came to tell me that you're a monk now. We do not criticize other monks. That if a monk has some wrongdoing, that it's between him and his teacher. That it's not your job to go criticizing other people. And I learned that. And so now, even on the Internet, I do not like to, to criticize not just monks, but anyone, Dhamma teachers or whatever, that in fact, if they are wrong about something, we can talk about what's wrong without criticizing the person. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of that issue of friendliness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That monks don't criticize each other, they're friends. Mm -hmm. You don't go around publicly uh, disparaging your friends. That makes sense. Makes perfect sense. So that's how the Sangha is set up. And I learned that lesson. That was a, <laughs> in that moment, it was an interesting thing to have happen. But I got it. And so, uh, in our relationship, I will not be able to create any of that kind of stuff for you. We'll just be able to talk about it. But your life's experiences will be good teachers for you yeah. also. Yes, definitely. We're finding that out uh, every day. <laughs> <laughs> OK, guys, well, I really been, enjoyed this conversation. This has been great. And I really appreciate that you told me that you can come out of your argument in your mind and become really friendly with yourself. That's that's it. Keep doing that. You've right. got it. Thank you again. This has been wonderful. Excellent. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye.